You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. It got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Tax Shield A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than ten thousand dollars to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose. U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Call eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> Eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. Eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. The internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. We will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. This is the most transparent administration in history. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Fact is, we had four dead Americans. What difference at this point does it make? If you got a business, you didn't build that. Oh, welcome to the face. Welcome to the face. Keep on doing what you do, Rick. You're my favorite host, favorite host, favorite host. It's time to hear the truth about America's biggest challenges. You're listening to America Off the Rails with your host, Rick Robinson. All right, folks. Well, happy Monday evening. We've survived another one. I am Rick Robinson. You are listening to America Off the Rails. And here in just a moment, we will have the one, the only, Gavin Mitchell with us of The Gavin Mitchell Show. Uh, if you've been uh, hanging around talk for a while, you'll know he's been with us now for the last few weeks. We figured it was about time to get him on live and give him a chance to both to, to get to know yours truly, but for me to get to know him and also give you guys a chance to maybe hear him for the first time that maybe haven't figured out his show is on K98 Talk yet because it's only been a couple of weeks. So without further ado, uh, good evening, Gavin. How are you? Hey, Rick. How are you doing, man? I figured why not wait till the caucus started to, to get a, get on in and get it done, huh? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it's a good TV night. I mean, you can you can watch Fox and they can have math errors and it's, it's <laughs> you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Excited to be here, brother. Thank you for having me. Very glad to have you here. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing I always do and put you on the hot seat for the first few minutes of the show. What I want you to do is take a moment, explain a little bit about you, what it is that has brought you to where you are, and what caused you to decide to get the crazy idea that a lot of us have and have started a talk show, of all things. So why don't you take a few minutes, just let everybody kind of get to know you and where you are and where you stand on things, and we'll just take things from there. Okay, well, we... um I say we, and, and why I say we will become very evident as, as we move through the progression. But 
Um, we're we're out of the Dallas Fort Worth market. That's that's where we record and broadcast from. Uh, both Ron Phillips and I. He is my executive producer. Uh, we're from this area. We grew up in this area, and this is home to us. And Ron has been a family friend for many years. And I I don't know to be honest with you, Rick. What made me do it? I've always been a great fan of Mark Levin and Rush and Hannity and, and Glenn Beck and the, just the whole spectrum of conservative talk and, and just how they built rational arguments. And so for whatever reason, I went and bought a little condenser microphone and and plugged it up to my computer and decided I was going to cut me a few segments. And Ron has a background in radio, so I took it to Ron. I was like, what do you think? Well, he played about 30 seconds of it and said, no. I need you to come to the house. I said, well, okay. So I show up at Ron's house, and he has a full studio built built in his home in one of the bedrooms. And he's like, get in there and try it. And it was a great sound. Ron and I work great together. We know each other well, both in and out of the studio. And we, we just let this thing grow organically. If someone's interested in the show and they, they want to air it on their network, we let them have it. If if someone wants us to do this, we do it because what we've realized very quickly is that by taking the platform that we're going to take the facts as we know them, collect them, and then make a sound decision or judgment on the issue based on who we are and, and who we are being from Texas is, uh, you know, we work hard, we play hard, we, we believe Christ died for our sins, and we believe we have a God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's who we are, and that's what we're about. And when you tie that into a certain or specific fact set, then, then nine times out of ten you come up with a conclusion that happens to be conservative. We don't claim to be right all the time. In fact, we encourage dissenting arguments. We, we want to hear the other side. That makes for great radio. But what I hope at the end of the day is that we encourage people to think, we encourage people to, to pursue knowledge, and to come to an educated conclusion and be able to support that conclusion with whatever facts they have. And so that's that's kind of who we are and, and, and what we're doing. And, uh, man, I'm just having a blast. I'm having a blast meeting people like you and other patriots across the country that either we've reached out to them, they've reached out to us. That doesn't matter. What matters is that there is a collective movement through this new media of people who care about this country. And and that is exciting. It's energizing. And for whatever part we're playing in that, we couldn't be more excited. Well, I will tell you, it's been an honor uh, getting to know you, and I really enjoy your show. Um, actually, um, that was one of the reasons I reached out to you. I am impressed, and I don't know if uh, who uh, who deserves more of the credit, but you guys' show sounds amazing. And it, that that is Ron. Ron deserves all the credit. In fact, we we had some meetings today. Uh, if you stay tuned into our show, we may let the cat out of the bag as the week progresses, but. All I do is show up and run my mouth, Rick. That's really all I do here. And that is the God honest truth. Everything else and all the credit belongs to Ron, hands down. And he'll, he'll argue with you. He'll tell you differently. But as sure as I'm sitting here, Ron Phillips is, is what makes whatever quality of a show we have be worth the listen. Well, I can definitely say it is uh, great content. I, I love the idea because he gave me a little bit of an idea of how you guys do things behind the scenes. I really like the way that you guys kind of uh, do it in smaller segments and then put it together as you as you go. I think that's a really good idea, especially for something that's not necessarily a live show. I have to tell you, podcasting for me has always been hard. I mean, even when nobody was listening and I knew nobody was listening, I still preferred knowing that it was a live element. I know, I, so hats off for one, because for me, it's always hard to do a pre-record show. I mean, I do them, don't get me wrong. I do them for a couple of different places because I want to make sure that I send them fresh content and I don't necessarily want to rerun something that's already been heard or one of the shows that I've already done this week. But I, I still feel like overall, the flavor for me is much different when I'm live. And you don't, you don't, I don't lose that when I listen to yours. There are some shows that you can listen to and you can tell that it was pre-recorded. Yours seems like it, it seems like I'm listening to it live as it's happening. So hats off to you because you do that pretty well. So, well, I, I appreciate that. But I, again, the, the two segments, just to be completely clear, was because I didn't know how I was going to get into a room and talk for 30 minutes straight. I, I needed a break. I needed a, I needed a water break. I needed a restroom break whatever the case may be. And so Ron has stepped up and, and he's done his thing and, and he's able to piece it together. And 
Him and the boys at Pinnacle Voice Studios are incredible. And, and I'm telling you, it sounds like I'm I'm overly uh, grateful for what they do. I'm telling you, anything that is positive out of this show is a credit to the boys at Pinnacle Voice. It's it's that simple. Well, if they're not a sponsor of yours yet, they might as well be. <laughs> <laughs> PinnacleVoice.com. PinnacleVoice.com. Yes. Speaking of which, I have been a bad host. I want to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors. Now, we'll play some spots for a couple of them in a second or in a minute, a few minutes, but I don't have spots for one of them yet. One of our newest ones is politibrig.org. You can find them pretty easily. You can follow them on Twitter. They have a YouTube channel and you can go to the website. If you're not sure what they offer, let me give you a little bit of a hint. If you watch as much of this political stuff as I do all day, every day, um, eventually you start wanting to throw things at your TV. They will let you throw something at your TV without breaking it. It's a nice foam brick with either the name of the candidate you don't like or the one that you do like. Um, and they will let you have all of them. They have six right now. You can get all of them for five bucks. So just go ahead and hit their website. I just realized I didn't do that before we got started, so I figured I'd get that in there. All right, so we've given everybody a bit of a chance to get to know a little bit about you and what got you started. I have to admit, your story is a little bit different than a lot of the ones that I hear. Uh, most of us that have started this new media thing, um, we all started kind of the same way. We started it as like a Facebook page or through Twitter, and then it was like, yeah, this isn't quite working the way I thought. And then had the crazy idea of starting a podcast, and then the rest of it was all kind of history. Um, now... I do have a couple of questions because, like, uh, well, like I said, when we weren't on the air, you and I haven't really spoke much before now. So, um, politically speaking, where do you find yourself on the spectrum as far as I, I mean, I understand from listening to your show that you're conservative, but are you more of a Reagan conservative or where do you consider yourself on that spectrum? Well, I, I, I don't know. Labels are they're, they're tough things because they're, they're so subjective, right? Um, I, I can tell you this. I am Southern Baptist, born and bred, um, and, and I make no apologies about that. I am a fiscal conservative through and through. All of the formal education I have are, is in the field of finance. Uh, so I, I believe in being fiscally responsible. I feel like I have a good understanding of, of how markets and numbers and money flow. Um, and I believe that, that God has a plan for us, and I'm not smarter than God. And so as far as I'm concerned, my God doesn't make mistakes and he has a plan. And unless I'm completely arrogant, it's probably a good idea to yield to that plan. And so when, when you piece those things together and, and through the Southern Baptist values and the Christian values, you find where family fits in and the value of life and the appreciation for the biblical definition of a man and a woman marriage being fiscally responsible, things of that nature, small government, because I, I don't like people in my business. I, I'm a big fan of protecting what's me and mine. Uh, you begin to piece together where I'm at. Now, I, I think if conservative review, excuse me, conservative review came out and gave me a Liberty score, I, I wouldn't be a hundred percent because there are some things that I might be a little more moderate on, but on the whole, yeah, I, I'm conservative, but that's not by design. That's, that's by, that's by result. That's that's just how it turns out. All right. So you mentioned a, a few things that, uh, as you said, if they were to give you a score, you probably wouldn't be a hundred percent because on a few things you are more moderate. Um, what are some of those things that you're more moderate on? Well, it's it's actually turned into a little mini platform for me. Um, I, I'm not a big lock them up and throw away the key kind of guy. Um, I believe, and again, this goes back to, to my Christian roots. I believe that, that Christ died on the cross for my sins. I am a sinner and that all sins created equal. And I've been given mercy and grace by that happening. And so with that said, we're all fallible. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. And it's man that grades those mistakes, not God. And I've been instructed to be, to, to, to attempt to be Christ-like. So with all of that said, I have a firm belief for people who who break the law, they they should be punished accordingly because we we have a social contract. And in that social contract, it says that the judiciary, whether it's a jury of your peers or a judge, will sentence you according. And once you have served that sentence, I really believe these people ought to have a second chance at life. And, and I understand and I hear loudly there are arguments from the other side, well, 
what about that person that killed somebody? Or what about that person that did the unthinkable to person X? I, I get it. But we can't undo that. But what we can do is invest into that person and hope they change and hope they turn it around. Now, with all of that said, all we can do is offer them an opportunity. We have to give them the opportunity to work. We have to give them the opportunity to succeed. If they do not take it, that's on them, right? And, and that's that's just one of one of the very few things where I would I would. Say to turn them around and be a productive citizen again after, and this is a big key to, to my position, after their debt has been paid. And, and that debt is determined by the social contract, not by you, not by me, but by the laws that are on the books. Well, you know, um, believe it or not, I actually agree with a lot of what you just said. I think one of the biggest things that, that I have a problem with in our nation right now it, it, is honestly – and this is going to sound weird coming from someone who's a capitalist, but the privatization of prisons, I think, has had a lot more negative impacts than it's had positive ones. And I think we need to find ways to deal with that that don't necessarily keep the whole turnstile system going. And not only that, but basically get it to the point where, I mean, because the whole idea of prison when it first started, well, not when it first started, but when it started in this country was the idea of re rehabilitation. I think they've kind of gotten away from that a little bit. I think it's just gotten to be yet another way that they can find to make money. And I also think that there are things that we need to do differently. And there are times that I do think that we are a little too harsh. I mean, I'm not going to be the one that has to decide what exactly it is that we need to do. I just know that in my heart, I feel like there's a few things there that we really need to look at changing. And I think one of those things is the fact that we need to start making sure that we understand that once these people have served their sentences, they were found guilty, they served their sentence, and now they're free, and they need to be treated that way. Because, I mean, I have people in my own family that have done stupid things that now have things on their records that will never go away. And they can't sure. find decent jobs, and they're not able to do this. And it's because they did stupid things, and they understand it now. And I understand the other side of the argument, because how do you really know if somebody's learned their lesson? Well, you don't, but you also well, have Rick, to give the, them... The way you learn that is by giving them the opportunity to prove it. Trust is earned. And, exactly. and it'll be a one step at a time. But yeah, that, it, the, the crazy thing is all the, the work I've done with, with these foreign uh, felons, these, these convicted felons, all they want is an opportunity to work an honest job. And they feel like the cards are stacked against them. And, and it's just, it, it goes right along with what you're saying. And it, it's a shame. It's a shame because they've, they've served their time. They've paid their debt. You know, and, and that, and that it kind of, kind of, kind of, pardon me, kind of goes along with something that I saw on the internet today. It was a meme. And honestly, it, it came from someone that I'm pretty sure is a liberal and it was still pretty poignant. Uh, that's actually a friend of mine on Facebook. And it pointed out, you know, that uh, Donald Trump has been able to file bankruptcy, what now, three or four times and is able to run for president. Hillary should probably have been convicted for half a dozen crimes by now, if not more. She's currently running for president. If either one of those things happened to a common everyday person, it would be difficult to find employment. And yet these people are in line to run the country. <laughs> yeah. That should tell yeah, you the, something. The, the hypocrisy of, of politics, huh? And it's just it's just one of those things where we really have created our own aristocracy, whether we want to admit it or not. And that was one of the things that drove me to start the things that I've done along the way is because I got tired of feeling like nobody was listening. And I used to spend all this time listening to Rush and Hannity and Levin and Glenn Beck. And I would listen to them and I'd say, I agree with everything that you said, but you probably should have said it like this. And then. Eventually, I realized they weren't responding to my emails and they didn't really care. So I started doing <laughs> it on my own. <laughs> yeah, They're like, hey, we already found our niches. You go away. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so I, you know, I don't know if you thought I was going to uh, be one of those guys that was going to browbeat you over the fact that, oh, my God, you think we should be nice to people that have been convicted of crimes? No, I've, I've seen it firsthand. Um, and actually, my 
experience before I started doing talk radio was in private investigations, private security, and law enforcement. So I have seen all of those things from the other side of it, and I also see what our system does. And I don't know if it's by design or if it's basically just one of those things where it's kind of like our government's turned into. All of these things were started with the best of intentions, and look where they are now. Yeah, it's definitely not by design. Anything the government touches morphs into something that, that is completely out of control. I had a, had a professor in my undergraduate work that used to come in, and he would open class every day with, the government cannot organize a good game of jacks. And, and, and there's so much wisdom in that off-the-cuff comment. Anything the government touches, it just turns into a debacle. And you and I could run a list of probably 100,000 things in an hour that, that hold true to that statement. And that's part of why the big government has to go. It, it's it's got to go. No, I would completely agree. All right, so we're coming up to the bottom of the hour here pretty quick. So let's get in a couple other quick questions, and maybe we'll change gears when we get back. Just a little bit more about you. I know you're one of those guys from us talking that you like to keep your opinions close to your vest. But I have to ask you, what are your thoughts on Trump? I just have to know. My thoughts on Trump. Oh, wow, what a loaded question. Exactly, um, that's why I asked I, it. I think he's incredibly brilliant. I do. I, I think he's incredibly brilliant. I think he lacks tact, and that's a tactful way of saying it. Uh, th- there's no questioning where he stands when he opens his mouth, but it, it does cause pause for me that this, and I'm sure you've seen it, Rick, the the Meet the Press clip that it has been circulating is circulating about him just a handful of years ago saying that he was absolutely pro-choice and he was for gay marriage and and all of that's fine and and you'll hear the the commentary now well no one no one has advertised that trump's a conservative trump hasn't come out and say if you think trump is a conservative you're wrong but he's running on the conservative platform and, and his 180 on a number of important issues, at least to a conservative voter, it causes pause for me. Now, that doesn't mean that other people haven't caused me to, to scratch my head and say, well, hold on, you know, in a great case, just so I don't get more emails saying I'm favoring one side over the other. I, I'm not happy with this mailer that that crew sent out. Um, grading people's voting score. And I'm very, very disappointed in that action by their camp. So I'm now fair and balanced, Rick, going back to Trump. Um, Yeah, I think he's brilliant. I think that he's smart enough to know what he doesn't know, and he will surround himself with people that are experts in the field in question if he were to become president. And then that's what a wise man does. If he doesn't know something, he brings in the best he possibly can to solve that problem. Um. But with all of that said, I just don't know that he's the steadfast conservative we may want uh, right now because the pendulum swings to extremes and and it's as far left as it could possibly be right now. It's going to fall back to the right. The question is, is Trump enough of that? And and how many of these promises is he going to keep? Because he sounds great right now. I mean, he sounds very appealing. How many of these promises is he going to keep once he gets in office? And that, to me, that's that's the question voters have to a- answer. Now, um, I'm about to mention a name that I know you know because one of the first shows I ever heard that you did was you interviewing him. I have to tell you, one of the people that kept swinging me back around to Trump, despite <laughs> all of my instincts, was Patrick Fernari. And I, I know you've inter- interviewed him because mm-hmm. he's done his book, uh, The Commoners. Uh, Commoner Sense, the working man's are working person's guide to america um one of the things that he keeps bringing up in a lot of his columns and i've had him on a lot up until recently we don't talk as much as we used to i think he's mad at me over my anti-trump stance but um he's um (laughs) usually one of the ones that will keep bringing up that at this point maybe the country needs a transitional candidate more than they need a transformational one because we wound up getting a transformational candidate with obama and his stance the whole time is we kind of need just a transitional candidate to start pushing us back in the other direction and 
I actually have to say, I, I, I can see the logic there. So it's been one of the things that up until recently had kind of still been, you know, maybe if he gets the, the, to the general, I can pull the lever. But I got to tell you, the more I research the guy and the more I hear him say in his own words the things like, as far as he's concerned, the government should be using our money to take care of everybody when it comes to medical care. And he doesn't care if it loses in votes because he knows it's not a Republican thing to say, but he's going to say it anyway. And also... Not to contradict what you just said a moment ago, but I actually have heard him say that he's a registered Republican, and as far as he's concerned, he's a conservative. But a lot of his viewpoints do not align with that, that one specifically. Um, Not to mention the fact that as far as I can tell, he's never really had a change of heart when it comes to um, partial birth abortion. I mean, maybe abortion in general, but for some reason he's still holding pretty tightly to that one at least from what I've been able to tell. So, I mean, my biggest problem with him, and it's not even really necessarily him, it's the type of people that are gravitating to him. And maybe it's just because I spend an inordinate amount of time when I'm not at work on social media because I'm trying to build my brand. But I see all of these... I mean, there's not a nice way to put it. These are, these are not nice people that are just... As soon as you say, I, this is, I'm not for Trump and this is why... Oh, you're a rhino, you're an idiot, and those are the nicest things I've been called. Most of them aren't fit for radio. And I think that's what has me concerned, is we've already had, for the last seven, now nearly eight years, a a candidate, I can't even really call him a president, because he's never stopped campaigning, who has been going around getting his side as angry as he could possibly make them at as many people as he could get them angry at, and now we have on our side a candidate who hopefully will remain a candidate, um, that is doing the exact same thing. And that's what has me concerned. We have stopped looking at hope as much as we've started looking towards anger. People are embracing the anger now instead of trying to use it to make things better. They're embracing it and they're grabbing onto it and they're admitting that they're angry. But instead of doing something constructive with it, they're just hanging onto it, getting, getting even more angry. And I think that's what he's managed to tap into. And that is one reason why I'm extremely concerned about how well he's been doing in the polls for as long as he has been. Because I think at this point he could literally do just about anything. And the people that are supporting him are never going to waver. And that scares me. Well, he's proven that. And there there was so much in in the comment you just made. Um, One, there is no question that the Trump candidacy came out of this administration's pure neglect for what's best for this country. The, the Obama administration has, has made promise after promise and broken promise after promise. And they, they have a real good streak at just flat out lying to the American people so much so that I actually called president Barack Obama, the con man in chief on my show, because the only promise he has kept since he began to campaign is that he was fundamentally going to change this country. And he has done that. He has done that very well, but it's been the only promise he's kept. And out of that anger and out of that bitterness and out of, and it's not just the left's fault. We have a Republican party that we were told, well, we we don't have Congress. So we gave them the house and we gave them the Senate in the last two elections. And now we're told we don't have the white house. We have no opposition party to the president and to this administration. And so it's not just something we can blame on the left and the Democrats. It's something we have to blame both parties for and the establishment of both parties. And so when you have a dynamic like that, that that is brewing in this perfect witch's brew, you get a bunch of people who love this country, who care about this country, who are concerned about the direction we're headed. They're mad and, and they're looking to grab onto anything they can And here comes Donald Trump, the polar opposite of everything that is status quo in Washington. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what he is. And this candidacy was was bred out of this situation. Had Barack Obama been a little more neutral, if you will, had we actually had an opposition party, there would be no Donald Trump. Make no mistake about it. But I also noticed the vigor, uh, especially on social media and other outlets, not only from the Trump uh, supporters, but I see it from the Cruz supporters as well. And and maybe that's because I'm down in Texas and we have a lot of Cruz supporters here. 
and, and they're carrying that same vigor that the Trump supporters are. And, and excuse my language, but they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. And the big problem I see, and it's something I want to throw caution out there to your listeners, to my listeners, to anybody that cares about this country, is we've got to be very careful right now as we move through this primary. Because I get emails daily. Oh, well, I I can't believe you support Trump. He's a this, he's a that. I can't believe you support Cruz. He's a this and he's a that. Oh, Marco Rubio's. And they, they just... They take anything they can, and it's almost like they're looking for a fight instead of basing their opinion off the facts or what I may have actually said. I love the passion. I love that people are engaged in the political process, and and they're willing to fight the good fight. I love it. But at the end of the day, we are going to have a nominee from the GOP. And when that time comes, if it is not your nominee, we have got to be able to join forces to beat the left because if we have another four or eight years that is a continuation of what's going on, I don't know if this country can be saved. And so we are going to have to unite going into November of this year to make sure we get the White House back. And if, if tensions are so high and we have burned so many bridges casting stones at the other candidates, I don't know that we can come together. And that if you watch tonight, Rick, uh, Marco Rubio soared. I mean, he had a strong third place finish tonight. Everybody expected him to finish third. I don't know that we thought he would finish this strong. And the last couple days he's been he's been running on, I'm going to unite this party. I'm going to unite this party. And I think people are starting to wake up and realize that has got to happen for us to begin to move in the right direction come November. And so I know there was a lot there, but I think that is the critical takeaway that at some point we are going to have to unite as the Republican Party and support whatever candidate it is. All right. Yeah, actually, you dropped a lot there, and there's a lot of things that you've mentioned that I want to get to when we get back. But at this point, we really do have to take a break. This is Rick Robinson. You are listening to America Off the Rails. We'll be right back here in just a couple of minutes. For our own calls, we got a pen and telephone to buy. All right, folks, this is Rick Robinson with you. I want to tell you about some friends of mine from a company called Security Enforcement Specialists. When I ran my security agency for 12 years, I worked with one of these partners on a daily basis. He's been involved in this agency now, and with his other partner, they do have over 30 years of experience in the private security industry. If you own a business and you need someone to keep you or your customers or residents safe, then I highly recommend contacting Security Enforcement Specialists today. Give them a call at 405-703-1796. Again, that's 405 703 Three one seven nine six. Again, tell them Rick from K ninety eight Talk sent you. Like I said, if you need the help, they are here for you. So make sure that you uh, go look them up, check them out, and see what they can do. Wrong way. Welcome to the place. Welcome to the place. We will never fully understand what we've asked of our military service members or their families, asking them to put themselves in harm's way. To endure it all. But we do understand that it's our turn, our duty, to keep them secure for the rest of their lives. Wounded Warrior Project long term support programs help our most severely ill or injured veterans live independently, at no cost, for life, so that they might stand at ease. Join us at findwwp.org. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino and how to get the money you need when you need it simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com. 
All right, guys. We're ready for our Four Seasons sunroom, and Daddy's going to get a rec room with refreshments. Oh, no. We'll be sleeping under the stars. Mom, what about the one with, you know, the fun? Nice try, little bro. It's a gym. My gym. Hey, Grandma's getting her Four Seasons garden room. Weather tight and still like being outdoors. Maybe a living room. Oh, no, wait. A family hub. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what the budget, the season, or the climate, Four Seasons Sunrooms let you and your family enjoy the outdoors inside. Call now to receive your free, no-obligation brochure from the premier manufacturer of sunrooms since 1975. More reasons for Four Seasons Now. To find out more, call toll-free 800-928-7007. That's 800-928-7007. Call 800-928-7007 today. The Internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. All right, folks, we are back. We are live. This is America Off the Rails. Uh, Hang on a second. I didn't get the volume down there low enough, so you heard me talking twice there. All right, so we're back. We're live. This is America Off the Rails. We're into the last half of the show here. Uh, Still have Gavin Mitchell with me. Now, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that you said because let, let me tell you, because this time in 2012, I was exactly where you are right now. I was the one that was screaming, you know, no matter what, if Romney's the guy, we've got to pull the lever. We've got to do it. If we don't, look where we're going to be. But I have to tell you, things are a lot different now than they were then. And even going back and listening to myself then, it was hard for me to come to the realization that I'm about to tell you. But from what I've been able to research and what I understand about Donald Trump and even what I understand about Hillary Clinton, I have to tell you that at this point, and this is just my opinion, I still don't know if I can pull the lever for Trump if he winds up being the guy that gets into the general. And I know what that means. But I have to tell you, in my heart, I don't see a difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. I really, truly don't. Because there there really is not much of a difference between the two of them, especially when it comes to the majority of their policies. I mean, if you can't look at his record because he doesn't have one. But if you look at what he's been doing with his money for the last 20 years, he's been supporting everything that he says he's now against. And I have a problem with that. So I really, if he's the one that winds up getting the general, and unfortunately if Iowa was any indication, we're a little closer than I was hoping we were going to be, but it, it, I, I just, I really don't see a way out of this for this, because in, in my opinion, now at this point, especially since everybody's coming to the foregone conclusion that it will likely be Trump and Hillary, I mean, everybody that I listen to that is in any type of media, whether it's print, everywhere else has already made the foregone conclusion that by Super Tuesday we'll know who we're going to have, and they're pretty sure that it's going to be Trump, and they're also pretty sure that Hillary's the only one that's going to be able to do anything in the Democratic Party, because you and I were talking off air earlier, and Sanders is just too extreme, and I'm sorry, to me, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, with those two as a choice, and I just don't know what to do. That's just my take on it, though. I can understand how you come to those conclusions. And th- there are some points, that, some nuance in there that I may not disagree with. But I-, I guess my question would be, what is the alternative, Greg? If, if if it is Trump versus anybody the left throws out there, the, the felon or, or the communist, uh, the socialist, what is the alternative? Well, actually, a lot of me and my staff are already considering buying a couple of small islands and just moving off the coast. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't give up if, if that's your position. And and I hear me, I can understand how you can connect those dots. Um, I, I wouldn't give up just yet because while Cruz did win Iowa and, and Iowa hasn't produced a, a nominee yet, right? That, that doesn't mean that it's over for Cruz. I think that win was very important for Cruz because there were a lot of personal attacks on Cruz, especially from Donald Trump. Donald Trump threw Cruz everything he had leading up to Iowa. And even with the misstep on the mailer, at least the misstep, in my opinion, on the mailer with Cruz, Cruz still came out ahead. And what that tells me is that Cruz can navigate the rocky waters. He can 
He, he can fight off the personal attacks and still find a way to victory. He's proven it, at least in Iowa. So with that said, come, come the SEC primaries, Texas is the biggest crown jewel there. There's more delegates coming out of Texas than all the other primaries put together. That is going to be a cruise win. I, I'm here in Texas. I'm feeling the pulse. I'm, I'm taking the temperature. It's a cruise win. We love Ted Cruz in this state because he did what he said he was going to do, even at the cost of his reputation and, and at the cost of his popularity. And we appreciate that. And, and so Texas will stick by his Ted Cruz. So I would say don't give up on Ted Cruz yet. I know you haven't, but I, I don't want anybody to confuse that. I think there's still a chance. And after tonight's showing with Marco Rubio, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a three-horse race instead of a two-horse race. Because I'm telling you, Marco Rubio now has a little swagger getting as close into that that race as he did. No, and and I would agree. And I don't want anybody to, to think I was selling Cruz short because I was actually a little surprised, honestly, that he managed to pull out Iowa. Um, but I guess the what I'm looking at is the data for the last few election cycles, and usually the person that wins Iowa is not really the last few cycles been the one to get the nomination. Now, I think you're right. I think it's great that uh, Texas is probably in a win column for him because that is the, the most amount of delegates that are going to be available in the, the, uh, the SEC system. But at the same time, I don't know. I'm trying to remain cautiously optimistic um, because, like I said, I was surprised to hear that Cruz managed to pull it out. I'm still not sure on that because I remember the last time uh, I don't know if it was this last cycle or the one before, but it seemed like there was like a big change like seven days after they made the announcement because they figured out they were wrong. I'm hoping that's not another yeah, one. No, no, <laughs> that, that does happen. But take it for what it is. Don't don't take it as a precursor. It's it's one of what, 53 primaries that take place. And, and no, I don't have fuzzy math. I understand there are 50 states, but the territories get the primary as well. Um, it, it's it's one of 53. This game has just started. But finally, we've got some data other than hypotheticals and projections to go off of. And the media is going to run crazy with it. And you're right. Iowa hasn't produced a winner as far as getting the nomination. At least, I mean, ask ask uh, Huckabee and Santorum how they feel about winning Iowa now. It, they, it got them nothing. But take away from it what you can take away from it. And that's that Cruz was able to navigate those hard hitting attacks from Donald Trump and from Marco Rubio and still come out on top with the evangelical vote. And that's to me, that's the only takeaway here tonight is, is that piece of the puzzle. Well, it's, it's not the only takeaway from me. Um, it's a big one, but it's not the only one. I think Trump will have lost a lot of wind in his sails. And I have to be honest, I'm not even sure why he went into Iowa. Um, other than the fact that he's a winner and he thinks he has to win at everything that he does. Because New Hampshire is probably a lock for him. I think I would have been focusing there because he's he's lost a step now because he didn't come in first place. And because of the personality type that he is, I think it may actually wind up being reflected and in, in showing that now he's going to realize that he's lost a step because he's, I mean, he's been ahead in every single poll, but he lost Iowa. I think I think in some ways that actually hurts him because of how far ahead he's been in the polls. Um, so that wasn't the only takeaway for me because, like I said, I was legitimately surprised when the announcement came across that Cruz had won it because from everything that I had seen and all of the data that I'd seen today, I was still expecting uh, Trump to be able to pull it out. So I haven't lost hope entirely. I was glad to see that number one was not him. Um, <laughs> but that's just yeah, me. Yeah, no. It, it was a good win for, for Cruz. And, and you know, uh, it, it's going to be fascinating, to, to say the least, from here – Till to the convention is it's just going to be a fascinating road to hoe, and so I, I'm buckled up and ready to go. Ain't that the truth? All right, so um, let's do something a little different for the last little bit of the show. Um, as far as the the candidates that we haven't talked about yet, is there anybody that in the debate cycle has surprised you so far that maybe you were pulling for a little bit that you weren't expecting to? Um. Yeah, Marco Rubio, and I don't know if it's a good surprise or bad surprise because to me it depends on on what day of the week you get Marco Rubio. But what's what's telling to me is 
if you'll remember from his times back in the state legislature in Florida, he, he was the handpicked chosen one. He, he was the one that they knew back when he was a, a state senator in Florida was going to be president one day. And he, he comes up and he comes through and, and he does great things and, and the establishment's all about him. And he had a couple missteps that I think were, they're, they're going to end up being tragic for him if, if my prediction holds true in that whole gang of aid and amnesty flip-flop issue. And it, it, it is impressive to me that at least on the, the initial debates, how good he sounded, how sharp he looked. Just, I mean, he was, I thought he may have outperformed Ted Cruz in a few of those. And Ted Cruz is the debating champion of the world. I mean, he's been to the Supreme Court so many number of times, never lost. He, while he was at Harvard, he, he never lost while he was on the debate team all four years. I mean, the guy doesn't lose debates, Ted Cruz. But Marco Rubio just, he was a shining star through that. But then as you watch these debates progress, you start to learn that some of these reactions and these answers and these comments are, they're canned. They're, they're prepared ahead of time because they all sound the same. And it just seemed to me after, after that and after the amnesty thing, the Gang of Eight thing and, and the, the failed attacks at the other candidates, I thought Marco Rubio, the, the winds were out of his sails. It, it just... I, I was for sure going into tonight, it was a two-horse race. But somehow, some way, Marco Rubio has managed to pick himself up by the bootstraps and jump right back into this thing. And by jumping back into it, it, it gives or lends to an interesting narrative. Because if you'll remember the, the previous weeks up to tonight, the, the establishment had abandoned Rubio and they were, they were leaning towards Donald Trump because Donald Trump can cut deals. He can reach across the aisle and he, he can make things happen. He's a businessman. He's all about compromise. He's all about negotiation. And so that was, that was the narrative that we were getting, that the establishment had left Rubio and they were leaning towards Trump. Well, now Rubio's back in this thing. He, he came, I mean, he came firing in and finished a strong third. And so now the narrative that I'm interested in seeing is where does the establishment land? Where, where does that support come from and go to? And, and where does the money end up? I, I mean, obviously, it would be Rubio or not if we're talking Trump. But does Rubio continue to gather the funds he needs to move forward as the establishment candidate? Or have they truly given up on him regardless of, of the outcome of tonight? Yeah, that will definitely be uh, interesting to see. Uh now, just because I'd asked you the question, I'll go ahead and give you the one that surprised me throughout the debate process. I don't think it's helped him much, and after tonight, I don't know how much longer he'll be in. But the one that I had been fighting tooth and nail, even more than Bush, uh, was Christie. Ever since the gotta hug the president moment, um, I have been oppo diametrically opposed to Christie. But I have to say, watching him on the debate stage, he was one of the few that I saw that was actually doing it right 99.9% .9 of the time. He was talking to the American public. He wasn't fighting with the other people on the stage. And anytime they started trying to fight with him, all he did was say, look, I've done something you haven't done. I've been the executive of a state, and I know how to get things done. And I think he was one of the ones that was managing to keep himself above the fray. And I don't think he'll be in the race much longer. And it took me a while to get to this point. But I have to admit, I think he actually did a fairly good job at holding his own on the stage. Uh, I don't think he managed to get any traction with the American people, but he definitely swayed me. Um, one of the things that I would like to see happen if we do wind up getting a Republican presidency, which for the love of God, please, hopefully that happens. Otherwise, there may not be another presidency for us to try for. Um, I do hope that maybe uh, since Christie will likely not get anywhere near the nomination, I think Attorney General might be a good spot for him to land. Uh, yeah, I, I could see that happening for sure. But that was just my take on that. Uh, now, at this point, we are actually winding down to the last few minutes of the show. So normally what I like to do, because we're down to about six minutes before I got to roll some commercials, I usually leave the last six minutes for the guest. So why don't you um, go ahead and remind everybody what it is uh, that you do, where they can find you if they choose to interact with you. Um, maybe if you've got any uh, good guests coming up in the uh, next few show segments, anything like that, uh, last few minutes are yours. 
Oh, well, I appreciate that, Rick. Um, but as far as guests go, I, I have to I have to admit that we have not worked extremely hard on on filling our quota of guests in the upcoming because we have some tremendous news coming. We we've worked on some projects and some things. Uh, the boys at Pinnacle Voice Studio and and the guys here at the Gavin Mitchell Show have worked hard on a few things coming. So I would ask you keep your eyes peeled. One of the many things coming is we just rolled out our new website and, and you can find us at the Gavin Mitchell show dot com. Uh, we, we launched this new deal called the Gavin Mitchell experience. And what we're going to offer with this is it's completely free of charge. You just sign up and, and you get to go through the Gavin Mitchell experience is, is we're just broadening our scope We're we're no longer offering just audio podcasts. Uh, there will be a video cast that, that comes along with that, that you'll have access to. And uh, I, I began blogging lightly where we're, we're going to start looking for people to, to to blog along with us. And if, if it's a great blog, we'll, we'll throw it up on the site for our, our listeners and our viewers and our fans to enjoy. But that's that's one of the great things coming. Um, I always encourage people to email me. I, I love the dialogue. I love the, the back and forth. Even if you disagree, I would love to hear from you. I promise nothing but respect and the rebuke. As long as we keep it civil, if we don't, then I, I just cut it off. But you can reach me at Gavin at the Gavin Mitchell Show dot com. Uh, we're on Twitter at the GM Show. We do have a Facebook account, Facebook forward slash the Gavin Mitchell Show. Uh, as as I think we mentioned off the air, we are making a big push for the Spreaker listeners. So if you're on Spreaker and you could swing by and search the Gavin Mitchell Show and give us a like, that pursuit for the iHeart Media. Uh, it is big on our agenda, and we would love to make it happen. And other than that, I would just encourage everybody keep their eyes on the Gavin Mitchell Show dot com and Pinnacle Voice dot com because we do have some exciting news coming that I cannot let out of the bag. Uh, and there's a few things working, so it's it's exciting times around here. We're growing like crazy, and and at the end of the day, we're just stoked to be a part of a, a bigger movement, something that's bigger than us. And whatever our place may be in that movement, we're all for for it because we're all about trying to save our country. And if, if we can just get back to that document that was scratched out in the late 1700s, we'd be okay. And, and that that's the goal. I think that's your goal, Rick. That's my goal. And, and as long as we can keep moving that direction, we're going to be okay. And, and so that's, that's what we're doing. We're fighting that fight. All right. Well, yeah, I agree. That's actually uh, the main reason why all of this got started for us. And it's interesting. Some of the things that you've mentioned, um, I hadn't planned on making this announcement yet, but we're actually doing a lot of the same things behind the scenes that you guys have already started. Uh, we are redesigning our website that is not launched yet. Uh, we will be adding a blog to the website. And one of the things that we're working on is to add video. I'm not sure if I will participate in said video because I have a face <laughs> made for radio, but there will be some hosts that do decide to exercise that. I'm not sure if Rick, I will be I, one of I them. I resemble that remark. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well I, I definitely know that I resemble that remark. I, I So... Um, another big announcement. This one I can make. There's another one that's coming uh, down the pike that I can't really make yet because we're st- uh, the ink isn't quite dry on the paper. But starting this Friday, we will start a new segment. We are partnering with Eric Williams from the, the barbedwiresatire.com. Uh, we have a new segment coming called You've Got Mail. Uh, that's all I can tell you about that one. You got to tune in Friday to check it out, but I promise you're going to like it. Uh, he's already a regular contributor to... Uh, JD and Stacy's Sunday morning show, Bloody Marys and Broadsheets. So we found a way to bring him over to America Off the Rails as well. And I promise if you like this segment he does there, you're going to love this one. But I can't really give you too much more about it than that. We do have a really big announcement that I will make public as soon as I get the authorization to. Uh, these guys actually managed to catch me right as the announcement was closing. So they already know, but I've sworn them to secrecy, so they won't tell you yet either. Yeah, so, I, I know. <laughs> and you can send the check to one, two, three. <laughs> I, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. No. Hey, no. If I was on somebody else's is, show and I knew that, I'd probably try it too. Hey, just send the money yeah. to this address. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. <laughs> that That is exciting news, Rick. And, and your listeners should be stoked at, at what's coming their way because that's fantastic news. All right, folks. Well, that is going to do it for this particular episode of America Off the Rails. I'm your host, Rick Robbins, and we've spent the entire hour with one Mr. Gavin Mitchell. I do encourage you to check out his show both here on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but also on his home uh, website as you see fit. Until I see you, 
put down the remote, get off the couch, find a way to get involved. The only way to do it is to get is to do it. You got to make a difference somehow. Game over, man. It's game over.